All right. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, earlier, when we logged on, we said that this was our 15th Monday of getting together. Um, seems like two years of, of time that has passed in this first six months. So a um, couple of things we'll do today. We've got uh, Matt Martin is going to uh, kind of report out to us for some of the executive board me uh, meeting minutes that were, if anybody has questions on those. Um, we did start, we, I sent the email launching the new YouTube channel, um, the double I triple A, thanks to Mr. Armstrong, we've got a, a new Zoom account. Um, and Mr. Holsinger for helping us out with that. So the uh, we'll, we'll still do it the old fashioned way until I learn how to make sure when we launch the Zoom that the YouTube launches. Um, so, but today we're under a hundred, so it shouldn't be a problem. Everybody should be able to jump into the Zoom. Um, so we'll kind of just go through some things and, and quite any topics that people want to talk about today. Um, and uh, Mr. Martin, I know you're on here. So if you want to go ahead, I think the virtual school, I know I had one, person already reach out about the virtual school question uh, and what that meant for us. So if you want to go ahead and maybe touch base with that, that'd be great. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Rob, thanks again for doing all these. Greatly appreciated. Um, so virtual school, uh, normally, you know, there, there's a certain percentage that, that you can uh, have your kids take virtually in order to be eligible for athletics. What the IHSA has done in, in a way to try to be flexible um, of course, not knowing what's going to happen, each school's system is different. They looked at waiving uh, that percentage, except the one in-class, uh, or in in-house class, much like a homeschool student. What we decided to do instead was, uh, if you are flirting with that percentage, or um, you know, needing a a waiver of sorts, you can apply that to. Uh, or apply for that to Paul, so that in essence, that virtual uh, course offering, I guess, uh, the limitations um, can be completely waived if it's in good faith um, and things like that. But like I said, that's that's based on, that's a waiver that Paul will send out uh, that you will apply, much like other waivers that the IHSA has anyway. The, the confusing part <clears throat> for us, at least in the meeting, and we got some clarification on that, was what is, what's the definition of a uh, virtual class? And basically what we gathered and in, in, in our, I guess, layman's definition was uh, a, a virtual class is, some, is a class taught online, not by somebody in your school system. So for example, if, you know, I, I know some like Richmond ha, has been talking about it. I think uh, Connorsville, I talked to Brent Duncan this morning, Fayette County and some other schools are, are, are doing their own virtual school taught by their teachers it just happens to be you know via zoom that for let's say for a student that either uh, can't be in class or, or wants to use this option because they feel unsafe if it is taught by your teachers and it is offered by your school then it is a distance learning class if it is taught by let's say ivy tech or some other entity that is a virtual class. And so that was kind of how we got the difference there um, between distance learning and, and virtual learning. But basically what the IHSA is going to do is, is, is be flexible. And if, if you, uh, and right off the top of my head, I think it's 30% is the normal uh, percent of virtual classes uh, that, that they, they are looking to be able to waive those in good faith if, uh, if need be. And once again, I don't know the 30% offhand. I should look that up before I, I got on, but, but they're basically willing to offer a waiver for these virtual classes. So Matt, if someone to, decides to go distance learning, mm -hmm. so a student, a Fisher's high school student doesn't want to come back to the building, uh, but they're going to watch all their classes from Zoom pr provided by a Fisher's teacher. That's a distance learning situation. Correct. Are they athletically eligible? It, it is. It is my understanding that they would be. Now, now, once again, we might need more clarification as we as we go down, based on you know, once we see kind of what we, what I heard uh, you know talked about before the, the ten o'clock hour was what each school is going to do is going to be different, and so 
between hybrids and, um, you know, like at Knightstown right now, we're planning on our normal schedule five days a week. I know some schools are, are you know, a, a combination of everything. I think this is going to be a, honestly, kind of see it as it goes in order to, to make sure that, that nobody's left out. Now, this is Heather McGowan from Ben Davis. What we were told was that if a individual student chose not to come into the building for school, they would not be eligible for athletics. If the school district went distance learning, then the district would be eligible for athletics if we were still having athletics. Heather, when were you told that? Because that, that was the stance that Paul had weeks last ago. week. Yeah, last this week. was last week. Was it was it before um, Thursday? Because Thursday is when is when we had our board meeting, and, and that's what came out of that between Bob Baker. And um, I want to say it was before Thursday. Okay. Um, so so leaving leaving the board meeting on Thursday, that that was my understanding that that they are willing to be more flexible with with the virtual versus um, you know distance learning and, and actually brick and mortar um, building. Once again, it's confusing to all of us. We spent a good uh, chunk of our time during our meeting, just trying to, to figure out what the difference was between virtual and, and distance learning. And, and finally uh, came to, uh, I guess we're told that that was the difference. If it's, if it's in your building, that is considered your class. Or if it's taught by your educators, that's considered your class. Are they gonna send out an announcement to all of us or? I, I, I hope so. That, that was, that when we left, uh, that was our understanding that they are going to uh, even define for everybody what the difference between virtual and distance learning would be. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just as a follow up, that was, I, I had two follow up questions to that. And I think one just came through the chat. Um, one, do they still have to, are they required to take the one class, enroll in the one class um, at the home school? And two, I kind of interpret it as um, once they go through the application process that the IHS, sorry, we got bells too. Um, <laughs> the IHSA is going to um, treat each application through a case by case process. So right. it wasn't just a slam dunk, your kid will be eligible, but they were going to look at each case um, case by case. Correct. That, that, that was my understanding. That's why I mentioned in good faith. Um, so that, so that they can see, you know, th that there's a reason or, or you're right. So there's a case by case basis in this. It's not a complete, um, blanket. It's much like the other waivers, like you would see, um, so that they can make sure that everything is done properly and, and not being abused. And, and once again, what that looks like, uh, I, I, I don't know if anybody knows, you know, based on what we're seeing, but, um, the first, the first question. Yes, I do. I do believe, or, or at least in the in the in the policy right now, it does say one class on campus. However, I think that that's also where that waiver can come into play, uh, if needed. I spoke to Robert Falkins on Friday, I believe, and I thought I understood him to say, if everything was arranged by our high school, by our guidance, and everything ran through our guidance office, that they would not have to attend one period in the building. Your, if it's my understanding, the, the um, distance learning, that's correct. Okay. Because, that, because that's technically your, once again, that, that's your teacher. It would be the virtual learning where that, where that one class might happen. And he said, even if that's like a third party, like where we're paying a third party to present that, information it's still coming through our guidance office or our school so that's acceptable the the, the way it was it was made understand to us if, if it is if it is offered by your school if it's a a i guess a credit directly from you right. not you know through ivy tech or, or some other entity that then it would come into into your transcripts okay. that if, if it's if it's straight from you yes that is considered a distance learning okay great thank you Any other questions in regards to that uh, 
clear as mud. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, it's my understanding that they are going to send out more information once we get closer. Um, and, and once again, our, our, everybody's plans are up in the air anyway, it sounds like, but you know, Monday's going to be fun. So it might be best as we provide direction, because uh, like, you know, a lot of school corporations are starting to come up with their plan of re-entry. Uh, and like, for example, for our corporation that we're going five days face to face, but they are exploring the option of having um, the distance learning because it would be a video, it would be a live feed from the classroom kind of thing. So I guess the, I think what would be, what I would think going forward and coach self, I see you're on here, so you can probably correct me here, but it might be best to say, if you choose, if you choose to go distance learning, your athletic eligibility would will be evaluated and, and, and you do have the possibly the, the availability of being athletically eligible. Correct. And I, and I see Leanne here said that, that, you know, she's right. The, the choice is, is, is kind of up to the school, much like if you, if your school wants to accept a homeschool student or, or something like that, uh, the local school or your school can make the, the more stringent or, or the tougher um, policies to where, you know, you have to be in for a, an hour or, uh, more than that. That's up to the school. If you want to go more than that, just like has always been been the choice, that's that's allowed as well. Hey, Matt, do you know if these uh, waivers are going to be going through the commissioner or the assistant commissioner that we do our transfers through? Because obviously uh, circumstances around the state are very different geographically, and I think it's important that they are consistent and I know the fear around central Indiana is that kids, especially on the outside of the county, are going to, if they don't have to attend a school physically, uh, may choose to flee and go to other, uh, other places virtually and then play athletics at those places. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know 100%, but when, I mean, when I left the meeting uh, Thursday, it was my understanding that it was going to be done by fall. I think we as an organization should uh, push for that personally. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to inundate Paul because I can see a lot of waivers being asked for, but uh, I think we ought to push for consistency and a common voice as opposed to, and I'm not trying to say anything negative about anybody. I just think it needs, it needs to be a common voice and a common stance. Sure. Absolutely. Nice part is in, in two days, I'm up as chairman. So, so this is this is on Chris's shoulders too. <laughs> the language that he put out at the end of the week says the commissioner can Correct. alter. Yes, and, and that's the same with every waiver. Yes. But assistant commissioners do do, do waivers of other types. So mm -hmm. obviously under the direction of the commissioner, he can have them do as well. Brian, I agree with you. If, if a school, I see some people on here saying that, you know, their schools are going to take a stance at a local level and say, no, if you're not in there face to face, then you're not doing athletics. So, I mean, I could see some kids then um, start wanting to transfer to schools that are, that are being more lenient with that. However, like I know it, they'd still have to prove residency unless you're an open enrollment school. Right. So I, I know for us, we would ask for a residency. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't think once again, this is, this is me. I don't think the ITSA would waive, you know, th those residency restrictions. You still, you know, live in a different district and, you know, be a, a non, uh, non move transfer, I guess. Agreed. But there's a lot, there's a lot of open enrollment schools around, especially in central Indiana. Sure. Right. So there's either going to be a lot of waivers <laughs> or a lot of transfers. <laughs> well, I think the the real challenge, and I think Brian makes a good point, um, particularly here in Marion County. I, I received an email at the end of last week um, from the parent of a uh, an athlete. We had two uh, female track runners that lost parents this past spring to COVID-19. They died. Um, one was a father that was 40 years old and one was a, a mother that was in their late thirties. 
I mean, so it's real. And the question that they asked was, if I decide not to send my kid back this spring, because the other part of that too was the caregivers also were hospitalized following that. Um, the question was, if I don't send my kid back um, this, this fall, will they be eligible for sports? You know, so those are what I would call a true hardship. Um, that family has a decision to make. Um, so in, in those scenarios, you would want, you know, the commissioner to make a case by case decision. Um, you know, this isn't a, you know, let me jump around and transfer, you know, situation. And, and I do think a kid like that would um, deserve to be eligible because, again, when you talk about, you know, do I want to be in a hallway with 4,000 kids or do I want to be outside and, you know, participate in an outdoor sport around, you know, 50 kids or 60 kids? Well, we'll let that parent make that decision. That probably should be a local school decision. So, you know, you can always find some exceptions, but when I received that email, that kind of brought me back to reality. Like, well, you know what? There probably are some some things that need to be looked at a little bit differently um, because we'll we'll probably see those situations. No doubt, and, and I think that's why it's, it's nice if if kind of like Brian mentioned that that we have and make sure that it's a centralized uh, waiver and it's done consistently. Yet, like you mentioned, the hardships are are there, and take it as a case by case basis. Um, and that those are obviously questions that I can't answer. Those those are above my my pay grade. But but yeah, I, I do I see exactly where you're coming from. Leanne Latshaw had a question. She had emailed earlier this week um, just to get some feedback. As you know, we have all these pre-screeners. We have all these different things that we are, are developing as individual school systems. Um, next week, we come back on Monday. We're ready to go. A lot of our kids have been traveling. Our coaches have been traveling. Is that part of a pre-screener to say, you know, you've just visited a hotbed of, of a COVID area? And, uh, or is that something that we're going to look past or, or uh, how do we handle, how do we handle that? The, just the fact that we might've been, we had, kids might've been traveling or ADs that might be traveling. I think Scott Stevens is down fishing and catching huge shark. <laughs> yeah, so Rob, last week, one of my coaches, uh, we, we meet every Wednesday. And then after that meeting, she said, hey, just so you know, there are, states who are saying it's an automatic quarantine or a, a test upon return if they're going to the hot spots. Um, what's our policy? And so when I asked the county health nurse, you know, she's like, well, it's not a bad thing to do, but we're not at a point where we're ready to mandate that yet, but it could happen. Um, but my coach said that there were some of the schools in the Indianapolis area um, where that policy is going to be if you were in one of those hotbeds it's going to be an automatic quarantine so i just wondered if this group is going to do that uh, we kind of thought what we would do instead of make it a blanket policy would be part of our screening and we would just ask were you know if that that question around were you um exposed to someone with covid so would, would you also out of state where would you where did you go and then have a conversation with parents before we'd actually let them back in but i wasn't sure with some of you around the indianapolis area is that true? Is that that you guys are considering that? Or is how, how is everybody planning on handling it? We have not made it part of ours for Southeastern School Corporation. Um, I see in the chat, Deborah said that she's gonna ask just to help with the contact tracing. I think that's you know not a bad way of looking at it. Um, You'd have to pretty you have to pose that question in a way that you're getting it across to parents that you're you know not trying to eliminate them but just for that tracing of it but uh, so that way, way, way they'd be honest. But um. Leanne, we had a we had a meeting Friday and our superintendent shared a document from the Marion County Health Department, and I did not see that on there as as one of the uh, questions we were to ask. Now that document is fluid and seems to change a couple times a week. So 
by the time next Monday rolls around, I could see them making that change specifically with Florida and Texas and other vacation spots if their numbers still continue to grow. If you happen to get that document it changed, would you share that with us? Absolutely. All right, thank you. I think, again, what we were going to do is just kind of call parents, because I, I have a I have a, a student athletic council. One of the kids in, the, in my group that we met last week, they were in South Carolina, but her mother's a nurse and she was with her aunt and a cousin who has like health issues. So they were over the top being safe. And that'd be one of those conversations. You know, if I talk to that parent, I'd feel comfortable. Hey, go ahead. Versus if they tell me, oh yeah, we were right out on the beach, right amongst it all. I, I to me, that's kind of a, a red flag, but yeah. The, Fun times, I guess, is the best. So one one question I have for everyone: um, We've obviously all of us have gone through either with our, you know, different levels of uh, engagement with this re, with these reentry guidelines that our districts have come up with. What about a, a pre screener? How, who who feels like they've got what? What kind of screeners are we using? Who feels they've got a really good one? Um, that's where I feel like we are still kind of in the development phase, like the implementation, right? Of like, what does that pre-screener look like? Are we going to, I know we're in our school, um, school and they're, they had a really good pre-screener, but it's not available to August 1st, um, hopefully. So that's obviously not an option for us, but does anybody have a, a good pre-screener that they've found or bought or developed? Robert, we are not going to do like a Google form or anything like that. Uh, it's just so touch and go in our district, whether or not we even have uh, internet or kids have data. So uh, I burned about a couple of rainforests full of trees uh, just uh, last week uh, before our coaches meeting and gave our coaches the, uh, the six question uh, questionnaire uh, every day pre-screened for kids. You know, they're going to have them fill them out on Monday morning. They're going to give them one to bring back with them on Tuesday. This is all crazy because uh, this has added a layer uh, to our positions uh, that none of us signed up for. But uh, we're going to just be paper, hard copy. Rob, we use uh, rank one. Um, and so they added a COVID screening, uh, which was $100 to our registration. Uh, so we're going to use that. So the student athlete will have to do the pre-screening before they arrive on campus. And that's online, ready to go for you guys? Yes, it is. Um, and there was discussion last week about how many questions um, they had to answer yes to before we would pull them. And after further discussion with our health department, uh, the health department said that if they had one, if they answered one question uh, with yes, and then if we had further, uh, when we had further discussion with them, if they could not explain why they answered yes to that, that we were to pull them and uh, contact parents and send them off to the doctor. A lot of final forms, people here in the chat. Rob, our, our uh, coaches, just like our teaching staff or any staff, has to be have to do a pre-check temperature uh, and then answer questions um, and sign off that they're fine. And then our kids, we're using final forms, the, the questions on final forms, which is a very quick process and talking to other uh, ADs in other states, they say it's a very quick process to ask that questions, those questions and click the button and move on to the next kid. Yeah. Hey, Rob, Union County used a um, Google form to do that. We loaded it onto our website. I also just recorded myself basically uh, running through a re-entry process, the stuff I covered in a coach's meeting. Uh, just recorded myself for the highlights for 
the parents and the kids and put that out on Twitter for them to view. Basically went through the um, health history questionnaire update form from the IHSA, as well as the requirements if you would have to have a completely new physical. And I, I did the recording through a Zoom meeting, which allowed me to share my screen. So I went to our website, showed them where the forms were available, the health history update, and then also um, the link to the survey, the pre-screening survey that they would take on a Google form um, and went through that, showed them the questions and that sort of thing. So that seems to be working for us. We've left the form open right now. So kids are experimenting with that. And again, it loads to a spreadsheet for us that is shared amongst the coaching staff and the trainer so they can um, view their answers. It'll You can set it up so it automatically highlights any yes answers so coaches can quickly see if there's any yes answers. Um, there are some coaches who did not want to use that method just because of the technology. So just produced a spreadsheet that they can write the names in and self screen the kids before they come in. But I, I think the video part of it is very helpful. Scott Hargrave up at Winchester put one of those out as well, kind of went through what they were going to do for their individual sessions when kids come in, you know, your, your water bottle, your social distancing check in here and really videoed himself going through a workout session on how they're going to do that. So I thought that was really good as well. Um, but putting that together and putting it out on YouTube for your kids and parents to view has been helpful for us. Thank you, Ryan. That's good stuff. Any other thoughts in regards to the screening or how we handle it? We decided that, that if, if a kid comes in and answers yes to anything, then that would be automatically evaluated by our trainer. Um, and then the trainer would then be the one to decide the next step for that, for that kid because some of them obviously may not be COVID related on that, you know, at least on the, um, actually I'm talking about the IHSA health questionnaire. When it comes, when those come back in, we're getting paper copies of those. Anything that's yes goes automatically to the trainer for immediately review, for immediate review. Um, if anybody has the magic answer, because um, one of the questions that the Marion County Health Department wants us to ask is, since you were last at school, have you had in, any of these symptoms and uh, fever, cough, chills, shortness of breath, loss of taste or smell, muscle or body aches, diarrhea. Um, our, if our kids haven't been active since the middle of March and they go through a couple of workouts, they're gonna have those, <laughs> a couple of those uh, symptoms. <clears throat> I guess my question is, uh, and I've already heard it from coaches, how do we differentiate between COVID symptomatic muscle aches, pains, shortness of breath and physical exertion, shortness of breath, aches and pains. I just, I can see where coaches are going to be very leery to push kids as they have in the past, but we also know that we can't treat them with quote unquote kid gloves. I don't, if anybody's got a, an idea on how to instruct our coaches to finagle their way through that, I'd be interested in hearing it. Unexplained, Brian. So they need to let me remember, remind the kids that you're gonna be sore, you're gonna be achy. It's been a few months since you've done this. So expect that it's the unexplained when you haven't been doing anything and all of a sudden your body just aches for no reason. Like when I get out of bed in the morning? Yeah, kind of like us. When you feel 90 and you haven't done anything, that's an unexplained ache. <laughs> We're going to try to have our athletic or our athletic trader have that conversation with teams, so that it's coming from someone, not the coach. Uh, so it's kind of an independent person to try to have that conversation with each team as they come back to uh, begin training. That's a very good point, Mike. 
get it from the medical standpoint versus the coaching standpoint? I think uh, going back to thinking about Ryan's re-entry video, I think I'm going to be asking my athletic trainer to be in a possible video to talk about the symptoms and <laughs> when not to show up. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not do that. I thought about that, but uh, that, that's good. If you want definitely the medical side of it, throw your trainer in there and uh, make them part of that as well. But those symptoms that Brian just mentioned, um, CDC just added those last week, didn't they, Brian? The, the diarrhea and those other things. Yeah, I think yes, I think a couple of them are are new to the list. I know I know diarrhea is, and uh, I'm not sure if I don't know what the other one was, but yes, yeah, the, the gastrointestinal stuff is newer and it's in younger people, or tends to be at least. And Marcus, the thing with that is that they'll put a little note in there that basically says these are some possible symptoms, but this list is not inclusive, all inclusive. I mean, they say that all the time and they keep changing the list. Yeah. I'm just glad that we got to talk about diarrhea on our Monday meeting. Yeah, but one thing you got to remember, like right now, there's a thing out there, a recall of lettuce. I know somebody that had that and not very well, and he'd have to click, you know, that he had that and it has nothing to do with COVID. I think combination of what Heather's saying with the unexplained and also letting the trainers be the ones to have those discussions. Like, I mean, there's, there's no reason our kids uh, are, are having a discussion with an individual coach about a symptom that might eliminate them from participation. Probably that's definitely a, a trainer's position to do that. I would say you need to be hypersensitive to all illness at this point in time. Um, and if there's any doubt, you know, don't allow the, the student athlete to participate that one day. And then, you know, they can, at least in our County, you can be tested uh, pretty quickly uh, for free. So, um, maybe if it's, if it's in your area, you need to look at if, there, if there's a kid that has any symptoms that may be COVID, it may not be, but it, it may be, you might want to err on the side of, of, uh, caution at this point. I think an interesting part is, is some of those, if these kids come in with these symptoms, we've already said that it's essential personnel only. They may have driven themselves or their parents dropped them off and parents aren't there and and some of these questions that our trainers are going to have um, may may warrant a conversation with a parent. So it might be a good idea to explain to our parents that hey, you, well, your kids at practice, you know, upon entry, we're going to we'll be asking questions. Uh, if we need to get a hold of you, what's the, you know what's that number that you can be that we can get a hold of you during practice? Um, that might you know because that might be something we need to think about. Any other thoughts or processes on a pre-screening, illness evaluation? Another, uh, we got an email, I got an email last night and this, this is kind of, I, I think I know how I'm gonna respond, but just something I think that too that just put into our minds that we, we may end up getting are the the parents that are um, not thinking a return on July 6th is the best interest and they're being hypercritical of, of the process and, and you know, what are we gonna do about it? And what are we gonna do if, if numbers start going up? Um, so the return message to those individuals, one, I'm, I'm thinking I'll probably make a phone call. I'm not sure I would wanna have anything in writing through email. Um, what are your thoughts on that? If, if all of a sudden you start getting emails from or comments from parents being critical of your of your return, it's a parent's choice. They don't need to come if they're not comfortable with their kid coming. 
we're using the Morgan County Health Department as the person that we're going to lean on to make decisions versus uh, whether we can continue on or if we need to pull back any so that an independent party is again making the decision as to how we progress. Mike, are you communicating that up front or just kind of on a case by case basis if you get questioned? We've been, we've had several meetings with the health department over the last few weeks. So we've got a pretty good working relationship with them. So um, we've shared information with them back and forth. So I, we're going to lean on them. We're going to do the same in Marion County. I know that the uh, all the superintendents of Marion County schools are in constant contact with the Marion County health director. And I think she has basically given them the opportunity to have a, a quote unquote direct line with questions and concerns. And um, in fact, our, our superintendent said we won't have a policy. Our policy will be whatever the Marion County Health Department tells us to do. That's what we're going to do. Same with us. Posey County Schools will be following that same thing. What I'm finding though, is that um, we have that direct line, open communication. She'll talk to us anytime, but she says, you know, it's really kind of up to you. And I, I would really rather her say, this is the way it's gonna be, but we're not there yet. So maybe that's a good thing. So outside of uh, returning on the 6th, other items that you guys may have been, that you're tossing around, thinking through um, in preparation for maybe closer to August or let's just get through this flaming hoop first and see where it goes from there. Rob, I had an assistant superintendent this morning ask me what my plan is for attendance at, at football games, which I told him I'm still thinking about that. Um, as any school districts thought about attendance at any of their contests. And another question that, that I wanted to ask, is anyone considering a reduced athletic schedule at all? Just simply like, you know, hosting a 14 team freshman volleyball tournament with all those different schools in your building, all the different fans coming from different communities. I did speak with a member of the Purdue Athletic Department this weekend, and now this is, of course, this wasn't Mike Bobinski or anything, but she mentioned she'd be shocked if Purdue football played anybody besides their conference schools this fall. So I don't know if anybody's considering a reduced athletic schedule or not. Ryan, I think, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead, Marcus. I think um, just within the walls of Warren Central, as we've discussed um, everything this summer, the, the likely pivot has been once we can get to July 6th and get these phases going, immediately we have to pivot and start talking about what the hell this is going to look like um, once we get to – August and, and what these events are going to look like. And I would imagine that the conversations with, with this group amongst this group will change start next Monday to exactly what you're talking about, because um, it will look different county by county conference by conference. I mean, uh, along the lines that, that we've talked, had this discussion throughout the, the spring and, and early summer, um, because I know, I have the same concerns 
um, that many of you have, and it will probably be along the same parameters that we've we've had these previous discussions. So I look forward to having that discussion um, just as much as we've had this discussion as it relates to reopening. Before I forget, Marcus, you bring up a good point. We're all going to be pretty busy on Monday. So Monday at 10 a.m. might not be uh, the best time to sit down and, and meet. So we might want to think through, like, when would we want to do that? Um, whether it's in the evening on Monday or or Tuesday or whatever. So I don't have that answer yet, but think through that. Uh, we'll, we'll address that. I definitely agree with you, Marcus, that we're going to have to do a quick pivot. July is going to be a little bit more busy uh, for us than maybe what we, other than just collecting physicals like we may have done in the past. Um, Steve Hoskins had a question just for clarification on the questionnaire. If they check yes, that's checking yes to anything since their last physical. Is that correct? Is that everyone's understanding? Looks like that is the understanding, Steve. Hey, Rob, I, I saw something on here about um, cleaning balls. Anybody have great ideas? Uh, the one ball that uh, seems to be problematic to me is football. How, how do you clean a football without uh, making it heavy or it's going to absorb a lot of the, the chemicals we're putting in? I, I saw that uh, Wilson has something out, but you know, what, what, what are people doing to clean their balls uh, between uses or after each practice or what have you? Dan, right now we're using the same thing we're using in our um, weight room. It's a disinfectant that our custodians have used to use we used it in our wrestling room and everything and basically it dries after basically about three minutes and so we'll just spray it after at the end of practice we have um we purchased big like almost the garden type sprayers and our coaches we have put that formula in there and they're going to spray down the all the if we use tackling bags, sleds, um, and footballs, and just basically let it set on there, and and then the next day it should be ready to go again. That's what w we've been told that we could do. So that's what we're trying. You know, my only concern was the actual football itself, because it 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 will be absorbing a lot of chemical what will that do to those covers versus other balls, which got a little bit more of a sheen to them. Footballs seem to absorb a lot of, yeah, I, I'm just concerned about day after day. What's that going to do to that football? So Dan, do you have a plan? What are you, what are you going to do so you don't have to worry about that football absorbing all those chemicals? Uh, no, that's what I was asking. I do not. Just make sure you weren't holding out on us. You know, the teacher no. with the right answer. We're all supposed to grasp for it. No, no. Worth Other stuff's easy. Other stuff's easy, but that football itself, everything else you can clean without any issue. But that football, I'm concerned it's going to absorb a lot and become hurt the hurt the cover. But that maybe not. I think basketballs would be the same way because they're leather and same thing with volleyballs. My tennis coach didn't like it when I said we we're going to use racquetballs. Um, I was kidding him, but 
That way we could just <laughs> dunk him in a vat every time he came off the court. But could have been worse. You could have said squash balls instead of <laughs> racket balls. Dan, you may have used some of that money that you made on the girls' basketball team over the last few years and buy uh, additional balls. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I know that in the truth. Uh, you, you don't necessarily you best, don't right? you don't necessarily make any money when you when you're successful. <laughs> Mike, was in, that. It was implied he was going to share with us too, right, Mike? No. In the chat, Emily Steinmetz and a few others have talked about spraying the cloth and then wipe the equipment with the uh, with the cloth as to avoid that saturation of of the of the uh, leather, whatever that might be. All right, we're closing in on eleven o'clock. I, I really like Larry Kissinger. He keeps getting up and down and having to put his mask on and off. So that's. Well modeled there, Larry. Well, he's also better looking that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, when, I think uh, many people in the chat start off with Monday and then the thought process, which you know, what happens, you get all these good people together. And, and now we're leaning towards Wednesday, get a few days under our belt next week. So maybe uh, maybe a Wednesday meeting, whether it's a.m. or p.m. Um, I'll go back through the chat and, and see if there's more of the, put whether it's Wednesday evening or what, what do you, I guess, throw that over there in the chat, AM or PM, like 10 AM or uh, 10 AM. Okay. We'll see how that goes. Um, so that gives us a few days to see how things are going and um, how the implementation of everything's, everything is working. Um, a few things in the chat, we talked about the Wilson, there's reference to the Wilson cleaning guides that, you know, um, if anybody has a direct link to that, um, maybe if you could send that to me, I'm not sure I've come across that. Uh, well, basically what we can do is put that, some of that stuff in that shared folder if it's not already there. I'm not sure if Ryan's dropped some of that stuff in or not. Um, but again, like I, I really encourage everyone to, you know, with, with your plans or whether it's a screener, guidelines, um, you know, drop things into that shared folder more people have an op opportunity to look at it and and, and uh, utilize those things anything else that anybody have or any other questions uh, i think i'm really looking forward to uh what direction we do end up going with ryan's questions about the attendance at contests and and do we end up with some reduced schedules um Rob, did you get did you get our um, re-entry plan? Um, I'd have to check on that, John. If I whether that was okay. I can send it to you again. Hey, Rob, I think some of us will get some insight on attendance at football once uh, we have some graduations. It sounds like some of us have some graduations that are going to be outdoors in the stadiums in the next two to three weeks here. That I think that'll give some of us some insight. I know Union County is going to be in that position. We're scheduled um, actually on a Friday night, the 17th, for our graduation. So we may get uh, some feedback on how that goes in terms of flow of traffic, uh, separating people out, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a good point, Ryan. I had noticed in the chat that Marcus had put some on there about training because um, I know that was one of the part of the guidelines about training coaches and staff about COVID and so forth. Does anybody have anything for that? Uh, we got a couple of documents from Parkview, but it's basically PDFs. They're nothing, nothing more. What I've heard is that the DOE is supposed to be putting that out and they know that we're under the, a time crunch here for the extracurriculars. Um, they, they, they originally their thought was get it out so you could train your regular certified staff and non-certs before school reopened. But then uh, somebody twisted their arm a little bit about the extracurriculars and that the DOE was going to put that out. But they're really running short on time here to get it to us and to get it to our, our staff. You know, how many of you guys use uh, Safe Schools? But Safe Schools has a couple of videos about COVID that we've 
forward it out to our coaches and they have to watch those before uh, the July 6th date. And then, yeah, the DOE is supposed to come out with something else. We're also going to get with our uh, the people that we're buying our supplies from, and they're going to train some of our people on, on the uses of the supplies. And then we're going to go out to our coaching staff and kind of uh, do a little training with them. I was really hoping that the NFHS would have put something out. I mean, that would have been a way that our coaches could view that. And it's uh, something uh, along the lines of what we already do with our coach education, but that didn't happen. I think one of the, Mike, looking at the, you talked about the safe schools and some different things that are out there. Uh, we may, uh, I may need to talk to our coaches, let them know that they might end up having to watch a couple of videos because if we do something to train them, then the state comes out and says, hey, everyone has to have this and sign off on it or whatever it might be, then they may end up being in a situation where they have to watch a couple of training videos about COVID. So. Any other thoughts before we close out today? Really thank everyone again for being a part and sharing. Uh, it does help uh, dramatically uh, as we you know, just try to stay in the groove mentally of, of what next Monday is gonna look like and doing the best we can to keep our kids and our coaches safe. Um, would also remind you that Dan Armstrong has been sending some stuff out about LTI classes coming up in a couple of weeks. So Dan, do you want to discuss anything about that or give information? Yeah. On it? yeah, I want, thank you. I was, uh, this is really, I would like for, if you were going to take a course, uh, if you could get signed up this week, I just resent it, uh, this morning. Uh, we do have quite a few have, uh, signed up. If you've asked me a question via email that I needed to find an answer for, I'll be answering you here shortly. I do have a couple answers on those uh, and I'll get back to you. But if you're going to take a course and, and if you know anybody that needs uh, LTC 504 and, and if you've got a new AD in your area that's coming on, share that with them if you can, because I may not have had their email. I may not have gone to them because they're not in the system yet. So, uh, but we are offering uh, from the 13th of July through the 20th, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then again on Monday, a course each day via Zoom. Um, so, uh, and the Monday the 13th is the 504 class, one to five. Uh, we're going daily except the Friday class, um, which uh, we will do eight to 12 in the morning. So, um, if you chance the opportunity to take a class, and we will teach those if we have one person in it, two people, it doesn't matter, we will take the, we will teach the class. So. Um, get on it this week if you can. That way it allows us to get the rosters to the uh, NIAAA in a timely fashion and, and get, you, um, get you going. So then you'll be just sent. Once you're, we have your on the roster, we'll send you a link to the Zoom to get on, and you'll do that. And um, then we'll teach via Zoom. If you haven't taken a class via Zoom, it's a pretty good experience, to be honest. Dan, there's a question in the chat room uh, uh, whether assistant ADs need 5042. Um, obviously, that would be a yes, correct? That is a yes, correct. All right. We'll send a recap out of this because there was a lot of things in the chat. Um, so we'll make sure we send that out. The YouTube videos uh, still uh, that on the YouTube, the double I triple A YouTube channel. That's where all the videos will, will live. Um, so in case you need, you know, in case you were not able to sit through the whole thing today um, and you missed part of it, you can go back and recapture that if you wish. Uh, and then we'll look at Wednesday. Uh, let's just do Wednesday at 10 AM. I think that's kind of, what we looked like the consensus over in the chat was um, aim for that. And then uh, 
anything between now and then, if it comes up, um, feel free to shoot like Ryan or Jerry or I an email and we'll, uh, we can either address it through member messaging or, or figure out the best way to, to uh, address whatever issue might be out there prior to the start of next Monday. Hey, so Rob, we, if, if, if yep. DOE puts out that uh, COVID training video this week, um, could you pump that out through the member messaging if, if you catch wind of it so that way everybody's getting that information? Definitely. Thank you. I'll probably wait to do the um, recap, maybe maybe a few days. That way, if anything does come across, if someone sends some good, uh, either good pre-screener or um, training video or other links, whatever it might be. So we'll try to. I'll do the. I'll do the recap this Wednesday, and maybe that that way, if we have some things that need to be caught uh, and included, um, that way we're not sending multiple emails between now and at least Wednesday, and we'll go from there. Trent McCormick on by chance. He has a, a DOE connection. Maybe he could, uh, maybe we'll reach out to him and see if he can get an idea about the video for us. Okay. Well, again, thank you everyone. Good luck. Uh, not sure if our emails will be more busy this week with its moratorium or, or, uh, or quiet. So Good luck to everyone and uh, hope everyone has a good week. We'll see you guys. Dan Meyer, I heard you're taking quite a few LTI classes. <laughs> gonna try to take a few here and there <laughs> i was talking with dan he said you, you i think you signed you sign up for every every one of them not every one of them but a couple okay <laughs> that's awesome i enjoy it that's for sure yeah yeah all so, right appreciate you offering this oh it's it's a joy to see everybody that's for sure yeah, I've, I've learned, I mean, this has been hugely beneficial for me, you know, just starting off and, and cause without all this, I'm not sure I would know where to start. <laughs> so appreciate well, it. There's a, there's some really, really good people in the profession and it's fun. To, yeah. Yep. Fun to connect with them. That's for sure. Yeah. So. Yep. So. Well, I get to go finish my tiling project now. So outstanding. <laughs> Have fun with that. Yeah. Have a good day. We'll talk All right, to you. You too.